Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first hearing of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission's 2021 Annual Report Cycle. Thank you to our witnesses today for their testimony and for their forbearance as we hold this hearing virtually. I am really looking forward to the day that we can once again meet in person. I'd also like to thank the Commission staff, Leighton, Alex, and Sierra in particular for all of the work that they put into organizing today's hearing. This year is a pivotal one for U.S.-China relations. In China, it is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP has placed great importance on this anniversary. Globally, it is promoting a narrative of China's inexorable rise and the inevitable decline of the West. The story the CCP is telling around the world is one that is often based on lies and half-truths. To deflect attention from its early failures in addressing the COVID-19 outbreak, for example, its diplomats have falsely accused the United States of being the source of the virus. The validity of its economic growth statistics is being questioned. It's flatly denying the genocide the U.S. Department of State and many experts have accused it of carrying out against the Uyghurs, as well as lying about forced labor, detention and torture, and the destruction of religious sites, all of which have been well documented. In the United States, we have a new president, a new administration, and a new Congress all facing the most openly confrontational period of U.S.-China relations since the normalization of diplomatic ties in 1979. Since coming to power in 2012, General Secretary of the CCP Xi Jinping has been increasing oppression at home while acting aggressively in locations around the world. Last year's harsh crackdown in Hong Kong and the ongoing escalations of tensions with Taiwan the open militarization of the South China Sea, and the expansion of economic, diplomatic, and military activities in Africa, Latin America, and even the Arctic are CCP actions to assert itself on the global stage and promote a Sinocentric world order. That order, which the CCP calls its community of common human destiny, is one friendly to China's interests, its state-managed economy, and authoritarian governance system. After decades of greater integration, the U.S.-China economic relationship is coming under increasing strain. The CCP is continuing its unfair business and trade practices, barriers to the entry of U.S. goods and services, and ongoing theft of valuable intellectual property. Events of the past several years have also highlighted the national security risks inherent in concentrating U.S. supply chains in China. From electronics to pharmaceuticals, some of the most vital U.S. goods are produced in China, leaving us susceptible to breakdowns and delays in access. The shortages of medical equipment during the early months of this COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated the dangers of this dependency, prompting some U.S. companies to reconsider the extent of their operations in China. China's policymakers face a difficult economic landscape, a host of global challenges from the pandemic to environmental destruction, and a decline in public opinion in countries around the world. China's rise is not inexorable, and the West's decline is not inevitable. In today's hearing, we will explore how the U.S.-China relationship has changed over the past several years and the CCP's response to domestic and international factors that have driven these changes. We will also examine the CCP's goals for its centennial and how these goals and other trends in China could affect the bilateral relationship and broader U.S. interests. As the new Congress and administration consider the future direction of policy toward China, it is essential to understand these developments. This hearing will also preview topics such as the CCP's uncoming, upcoming 14th five-year plan that we plan on exploring in greater depth in upcoming hearings this year. I want to thank again our witnesses for their participation. Before we begin with the first panel, I will turn the floor over to my colleague and co-chair for this hearing, Commissioner Roy Camphausen. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'd also like to thank our witnesses for joining us today and for the effort they've each put into the preparation of their testimony. As the Chinese Communist Party prepares to meet its centennial milestone, China's leaders intend to show the Chinese people and the world that they have restored China's former prestige. General Secretary Xi Jinping has sought to turn a carefully cultivated narrative of victory 
in containing the COVID-19 pandemic into a success story of the CCP's governance itself. Yet this narrative conveniently overlooks significant vulnerabilities the party has created for itself. Rather than comfortably settling into a year of ritualized celebration, the party finds itself contending with a series of challenges, from economic weakness at home to rising tensions with the United States, to international opprobrium for its treatment of Uyghurs, Tibetans, and Mongolians, all of which dramatically complicate its domestic and foreign policy agenda. The party desires a populace that accepts what General Secretary Xi calls the historical inevitability of its rule in exchange for prosperity and national pride. But China's leaders are struggling to continue holding up their end of the bargain. Rapid economic development has created huge wealth inequalities. And China's leaders can no longer count on historic high growth rates to placate the Chinese people. China's rapid growth has also resulted in widespread corruption, which General Secretary Xi reiterated just last week is the biggest threat, biggest risk threatening the party's governance. And China's class of brilliant entrepreneurs find themselves under extraordinary pressure from the party. On the international stage, the CCP is determined to maintain a favorable environment, allowing it to continue growing stronger for as long as possible. Beijing has argued that its own government governance system was uniquely successful in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, that it presents a better developmental model for countries that wish to get rich quickly while retaining their independence, and that it has made a major contribution to keeping the global economy afloat. But its growing use of military and economic coercion has cast a cloud on China's ambitions to be seen as a partner of choice for developing nations. Moreover, the PRC's increasingly fraught relationships with not only the United States, but also the European Union and other major democratic countries risk undermining long-term priorities. Many countries in the Indo-Pacific now view Beijing's geopolitical ambitions with suspicion or even outright hostility. The PRC's ability to assuage their concerns while engaging in arrogant wolf warrior diplomacy will be a major test of its influence. The Chinese government seeks to achieve territorial gains without resorting to conflict, but its assertiveness has significantly impacted regional perceptions. Beijing's contributions to the aggression on the China-India border last year created a massive rift in the Sino-Indian relationship, raising questions as to whether Beijing is a viable partner for Delhi. The Chinese military and Coast Guard have increased maritime and air incursions, prompting a further hardening of views in Japan and Taiwan, and raising significant concerns in countries like Indonesia. In short, Beijing's provocative and even reckless behavior is highly risky for regional stability. Xi Jinping's virtual speech at Davos earlier this week can be seen as reflective of the increased confidence that Beijing has about its place in the international system and its ability to shape the international order according to norms and preferences it holds. But there are notes of concern in the speech as well, hinting at vulnerabilities to international pressure against Chinese excesses and pushback against Chinese assertiveness. It's therefore essential for American decision makers to also understand China's weaknesses and challenges as part of the development of a long-term strategy and effective set of policies that the United States can successfully address the generational challenge that China poses. As the Biden administration has taken office and the 117th Congress has been seated, addressing the PRC's ambition comes to the fore. Working together, with traditional allies and partners, and also with new partners, to address the implications for the United States of the gap between China's reach and its grasp is an urgent task. I look forward to hearing the perspectives of our witnesses today as they discuss this tension between the CCP's aspirations for its centennial year and the contrary realities it faces. Before we begin, I would like to remind you all that the testimonies and transcript from today's hearing will be posted on our website, which is www.uscc.gov. Also, please mark your calendars for the Commission's upcoming hearing on the PRC in Taiwan, scheduled for February 18th. Now, I turn the floor back over to Chairman Bartholomew for Panel 1. 
Thank you, Roy. <clears throat> Our first panel will address the state of the US-China relationship heading into 2021 and how policymakers in the US and China are reassessing their strategy toward the bilateral relationship at a time of significant domestic and international political change. First, we are happy to welcome back Dr. Robert Sutter, Professor of Practice of International Affairs at the George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs. Dr. Sutter has a distinguished career and has published extensively on contemporary East Asian and Pacific countries and their relationships, their relations with the United States. During Dr. Sutter's career in government, he served as Senior Specialist and Director of the Foreign Affairs and National Defense Division of the Congressional Research Service, the National Intelligence Officer for East Asia and the Pacific at the National Intelligence Council, the China Division Director at the Department of State's Bureau of Intelligence and Research, and as a professional staff member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Dr. Sutter will address the political dimension of U.S.-China ties. Next, we welcome back Dr. Mary Lovely, Professor of Economics at Security University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. She is also a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Her research combines interests in international trade, multinational supply chains, and China's development. From 2011 to 2015, she served as co-editor of the China Economic Review. Dr. Lovely will address the bilateral economic relationship. Finally, we, we welcome Dr. Zach Cooper, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and co-director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy. Dr. Cooper's work fo focuses primarily on U.S. strategy in Asia, including alliance dynamics and U.S.-China competition. He also teaches at Georgetown University and Princeton University and co-hosts the Net Assessment podcast. Dr. Cooper will address U.S.-China security and foreign affairs relations. I'd like to remind our witnesses to keep your remarks to seven minutes so that we can have a robust question and answer session. Dr. Sutter, we will begin with you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, to testify before the Commission on the specific topics that the Commission asked me to speak about. I have six topics. Um, I'll treat them briefly. And then I have, I was also asked to provide some recommendations. And so I have two recommendations. So on the topics, uh, current U.S.-China relations. The current state of relations at the end of the Trump administration is very poor, the worst since the dark days of the Cold War. Both sides show interest in improvement during the Biden administration, but prospects for significant substantive improvement are poor. China shows no sign of significant change in its practices challenging America. Unilateral U.S. accommodation of China runs against strong negative sentiment in Congress, in much mainstream media, and in public opinion. Number two, U.S. negative view of China. The catalyst for the steep decline in relations was a sharp negative turn in U.S. view of and policy toward China carried out by the Trump government and bipartisan congressional majorities beginning in 2017. Chinese leaders have been seen as untrustworthy, predatory, and dangerous. They undermined critically important American interests in a headlong pursuit of Chinese wealth and power at others' expense. Now, point three. China's reaction, changed view of the United States. Chinese leaders endeavored to manage U.S. complaints through repeated consultations between the two presidents. They reportedly viewed President Trump as a pragmatic businessman seeking deals on economic matters beneficial to the United States. Against this background, China offset disputes with the U.S. through relatively low-cost economic concessions. Beijing appeared to follow this practice in the protracted negotiations leading to the phase one trade deal in January 2020. At the same time, there was no significant let up of ongoing Chinese practices challenging U.S. economic and military strength and leadership in regional and world affairs. The fourth point, China's view of world balance of power and threat perception. The above balanced Chinese approach was in line with Beijing's view of the international power equilibrium and the threat perception posed by the United States. Chinese leaders have long sought an end to unipolar regional and global order dominated by the United States after the collapse of the Soviet Union ended the Cold War. 
The major U.S.-led economic crisis of 2008 coming in the wake of strong U.S. frustrations with the costly U.S. military involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan was an important inflection point in Chinese international calculations. Beijing now saw the world's only superpower, the United States, was in decline, while China emerged quickly from the economic crisis, gaining increasing prominence and influence. These calculations saw newly installed leader Xi Jinping, beginning in 2012, increasingly put aside the instructions of Deng Xiaoping that China maintain a low profile in foreign affairs. Xi's challenges to the existing regional and global order came at the expense of the United States, but they were done incrementally in ways that avoided serious confrontation or conflict in U.S.-China relations. Fifth point, China's domestic politics strengthened resolve against the U.S. In domestic politics, Xi went to great lengths to control the main levers of power guiding Chinese domestic and foreign policies using enhanced control mechanisms of the revived Chinese Communist Party, he advanced authoritarian practices seen to secure lifetime in leadership and squelched dissent in directing important advances in Chinese economic, military, and foreign practices. And then the sixth point is about 2020, a very disruptive year. The pandemic in 2020 was a major disruptive event. After weeks of malfeasance with disastrous global consequences, Xi Jinping led effective efforts to bring the plague under control and resume economic growth. There was massive propaganda and considerable medical assistance to offset negative international reactions, which worked in some countries, but not in the United States and many Western countries. President Trump now stopped communications with Xi. His administration, with broad congressional support, launched wide range measures, viewing China as a systemic threat to the existing world order and global well-being. Against this backdrop, Beijing reacted negatively and reportedly ended any preference it may have had for Trump's re-election. An authoritative assessment by China's top intelligence analysts in mid-2020 showed continuity in Beijing's view of the international balance of power and China's threat perception. The United States remained the sole superpower but was in decline. China continued rising, with most other powers seen as declining. Against this background, analysts in China and abroad forecast a Chinese approach to the Biden government that made little substantive change in the various challenges China, Chinese advances pose for the United States while seeking to ease tensions and avoid serious confrontation or conflict. After addressing these six points, I was asked for recommendations. I have two. The first is uh, continued strong American countermeasures against China's challenges. There's some debate about how serious these challenges are. I've examined them thoroughly in a new book, and they are very serious. Uh, and so I uh, associate myself with the, uh, with the chair's uh, comments at the beginning of our discussion today on the danger and the threat uh, that China poses to the United States in a whole list of areas. And I list them. Uh, military, high technology, exploitive economic practices, uh, leveraging uh, uh, economic uh, relationships, uh, coercing neighbors, uh, uh, fostering authoritarianism, and so forth. And I have a, a long list if you, if you wish. Uh, and the second point is bipartisanship. This was a unique period. The last four years were absolutely unique. As an old uh, congressional watcher and a China watcher, this is the first time I saw solid the otherness, as far as the Congress and the administration were concerned on China policy since the normalization. And so the upshot of this is let's continue this. It's important. Uh, we need to have it in some way. And I suggest Congress be open to this. And I suggest that uh, the administration be open to this as well. Uh, I'm optimistic this will happen. I think the Congress is very serious about this. And I, obviously the administration is serious as well. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I look forward to learning more uh, in our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Setter. Uh, next, we'll go to um, Mary, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Bartholomew. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with the other, mem other commissioners and my fellow panelists. Uh, the commission asked me to provide broad uh, overview of uh, questions regarding China's economic progress over the last uh, year. It's changing relation, economic relations with the United States and the changing policy environment that it faces globally. 
the bottom line of my testimony is that China has had little success. I'm sorry, the United States has had little success so far in isolating China economically. Moreover, our approach has heightened China's anxiety about access to technologies that it sees as essential to continued growth. Uh, lastly, the U.S. and its allies should move quickly to establish norms and standards for emerging technologies, welcome China's participation where it's appropriate, while delineating clear areas for decoupling. It should also provide a mechanism for a swift and effective response uh, to uh, violations of these norms. The Chinese Communist Party Central Committee met in October 2020. Its primary task was to assess the results of the last five-year plan and consider the proposed next five-year plan. A recent scorecard compiled by Dr. Scott Kennedy shows that China believes it has largely met the goals it set for itself five years ago. The Chinese economy has exceeded its GDP targets, growing by an average of 6.7% over the last five years. Per capita income in China now exceeds one. Uh, 10,000 US dollars. Another 50 million people were raised above the national poverty line over the last five years. The Chinese economy's performance uh, following the COVID-19 outbreak illustrates the resilience of the Chinese model. Hard, hard lockdown policies permitted a comparatively quick economic recovery, and China's GDP grew by 2.3% in 2020, becoming the only economy to expand uh, last year. China's position in global supply chains has been maintained or enlarged despite the pandemic and U.S. tariffs. China now provides 15% of the world's imports, 17% of U.S. imports, and 21% of East Asia, excluding China, uh, imports. Despite the pandemic and the trade war, which focused attention on intellectual property theft, FDI flows into China were higher in 2020 than the year before. With new institu institutional reforms, Foreign investors have moved into China's onshore stock and bond markets, with foreign investment in these sectors now exceeding 5.5 trillion RMB. China also concluded major foreign economic policy negotiations in 2020. Trade tensions with the United States diminished with the January 2020 signing of the Phase 1 agreement uh, with its ambitious purchasing targets. Perhaps a more far-reaching or long-lasting consequence is the successful negotiation of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, which combines and expands existing trade agreements in the Asia-Pacific region. Importantly, RCEP rules of origin encourage investments in Asia regional supply chains. They strengthen and complement China's infrastructure investments and lending throughout its Belt and Road Initiative. To complement RCEP, China is negotiating a separate trilateral free trade accord with Japan and South Korea. It is also upgrading its bilateral trade agreements with other CPTPP countries, especially those that are highly dependent on China's market. Most recently, China completed negotiations with the European Union for a comprehensive agreement on investment, a pact that is expected to improve access to the Chinese market for European companies and deepen their involvement in the mainland China. These advances in China's trade and investment relations lead me to recommendation one. In its oversight capacity, China should insist that U.S. policy recognize China's deepening integration into the global economy, despite its failures to uh, meet its previous commitments. Notwithstanding its economic successes, China faces profound challenges that drive its fervent pursuit for advanced technological capacity. China's growth prospects are clouded by the onset of deindustrialization, slow productivity gains, and demographic change. After more than two decades of rising wages, the international competitiveness of its manufacturers, especially in labor-intensive industries, have eroded. In 2012, China's industrial employment growth stopped. In subsequent years, China's industry shed millions of jobs. In this sense, China is already deindustrializing. The service sector claims a rising share of employment, but service sector productivity is low and it's difficult to raise. The government maintains near monopoly controls over high skilled activities such as finance, education, and healthcare. China's workforce is comparatively young, literate, and numerate. However, China has the lowest level of secondary school attainment among middle-income countries. According to Roselle and Hell in their new book, over 30%, only 30% of the Chinese workforce has uh, graduated from high school. 
Adding to these challenges, China is posed for a prolonged period of declining labor force size. Its population will age rapidly and dependency ratios will rise. Thus, as China shifts down from high growth to Xi's desired high quality growth, it needs to maintain rising real wages, but it will have too little human capital to convince to compete successfully with other advanced economies. Even in manufacturing, China is no longer able to squeeze more and more from a set of inputs. Reforms that raise productivity growth in the past have slowed. A recent World Bank analysis finds that China's manufacturing productivity growth has declined markedly in recent years, and productivity conversion between state and private firms has virtually stopped. This considerations lead me to recommendation two. U.S. policy will be more effective if it recognizes China's deep anxieties about its future and provide legitimate pathways for its development. China has set its hopes for long-term growth on creating and adopting emerging internet-enabled technology. Among the many tools that the U.S. government has tried over the past four years, the most threatening to China are restrictions on flows of advanced products and processes and access to the companies that produce them. Over the past three years, the U.S. has passed significant legislation to reduce the flow of U.S. technology to China. These tools appear capable um, of creating sh uh, sh chokeholds on Chinese tech development, at least in the short run, and they add further impetus to Chinese efforts to develop indigenous substitutes. They also raise the value of foreign tech acquired through force or uh, theft. These contradictions in China's current trajectory uh, will soon come to fore. And by this, I particularly mean the tensions between the market, it's, it's, it's uh, marketization and opening, and it's insistence that the state lead the economy. These, recommend, these observations lead me to recommendation three. China should enable U.S. participation and leadership and standards and norm setting for emerging technology. International norms and standards define what is expected of China, and this is important for China, and it provides a way to hold them accountable for transgressive behavior. Thank you, and I look forward to our Q&A. Thank you very much, Dr. Lovely. Dr. Cooper. Well, thank you so much, Chair Bartholomew and other distinguished commission members for inviting me to testify before you today on the current state of U.S.-China relations. I wanna take this opportunity to highlight three areas in which diverging perspectives pose a risk to US-China stretch. First, there's a widening perception gap on the cause of tensions in the bilateral US-China relationship. Polling shows that each side's views of the other are at or near their nadir. Yet American and Chinese experts disagree on why. Conversations with Chinese observers suggest that many blame the Trump administration for damaging the relationship. This does not, however, explain why China has grown far more unpopular, not just inside the United States, but outside as well. Americans are more likely to see the Communist Party's actions as the root cause of bilateral tensions. As Elizabeth Economy argues, U.S. policy has changed because China has changed. Today, 73% of Americans have an unfavorable view of China, and 72% see China as a rival. This shift has been driven by numerous issues, particularly growing concerns about the Communist Party's repression in Hong Kong, genocide in Xinjiang, and of course, the coercive campaigns that China has pursued beyond its borders. As a result, the percentage of Americans who reported no confidence in Xi Jinping to do the right thing in world affairs rose from half to three quarters in just the last year. This disagreement on the roots of US-China tensions will make it very difficult to stabilize the bilateral relationship in the years ahead. This leads to a second challenge, which is that leaders in both Beijing and Washington increasingly appear to believe that the other's governance system is growing more unworkable. Xi Jinping has argued that time and momentum are on our side. Meanwhile, Joe Biden highlights enduring American strengths and says China is not competition for us. Meanwhile, Polling reveals that many in both Europe and Asia have declining confidence in the United States and China. In short, experts in Washington and Beijing increasingly seem to think that time is on their own side, while others outside these capitals are increasingly skeptical. There's a little bit of good news here, of course. This divergence of views could dampen the likelihood of conflict in the short term if Beijing and Washington believe their competitor's window of opportunity is closing, then each may opt to wait for its position to strengthen. Yet there's risk here as well. A rapid shift in the expectations of either side could trigger a crisis, particularly if leaders come to believe that their hand is worsening and that a window of opportunity is closing. 
So this leads to a third area of diverging views on America's China strategy. We've already touched on this this morning, but there are, I believe, at least three distinct viewpoints, each animated by a different set of assumptions and metrics for judging success. One group of experts believes the Trump administration adopted the wrong strategy on China. They argue that the key metric for measuring a strategy's success should be whether it positively shapes Chinese behavior and dampens Sino-American tensions. A second view is that there is a more competitive approach is warranted, but that Trump uh, and his administration failed to execute that strategy effectively. These observers suggest that the key metric in judging U.S. strategy should not be the quality of bilateral ties with China, but rather ally and partner willingness to work with the United States to develop effective multilateral responses. A third perspective is that the Trump administration adopted the right basic strategy on China and implemented it relatively well. Advocates of this view tend to believe that the key metric for judging America's strategy should be whether countries are actively balancing against China, not whether third countries harbor positive or negative views of the United States. Unfortunately, each of these groups uses different metrics to assess success and failure of American strategy, and as a result, they often talk across one another. And whether the Biden administration can build consensus around its approach will in large part require it to manage these criticisms uh, and ensure that these uh, views actually come back in line. So resolving these diverging perceptions will be critical if the United States is to maintain the spirit of bipartisan cooperation that has long characterized US policy on Asia and on China as well. To that end, I want to highlight five overarching principles that I believe should steer U.S. strategy and policies in the years ahead. First, we have to present a positive vision. For example, the United States is most competitive uh, in Asia when it helps other countries succeed, and we could help other countries succeed very quickly in Asia if we could help provide them with COVID-19 vaccines and medicines at little or no cost, as we have done in other situations, as in AIDS relief in Africa. Uh, so I believe this should be a top priority for the incoming administration and the Congress. Second, we must avoid grand bargains. Overarching deals with China often sound good, but seldom deliver. American policymakers would therefore be wise to pursue multiple separate negotiations, recognizing that progress in one domain should not require agreement in others. Third, we should use targeted collective pressure. It is time for the United States to move beyond the broad incentives and penalties by targeting collective pressure on malign actors within the Chinese system. For example, like-minded countries should work together to ban sales of products from Chinese companies that use stolen intellectual property. Fourth, we should build discrete coalitions. Rather than pursuing a single alliance of democracies, the United States will need to build coalitions with allies and partners across different issue areas. Doing so will encourage countries to collaborate where they are the most capable of doing so and slowly build habits of cooperation over time. And finally, we should always leverage our values. When the United States downplays values or adopts reciprocal strategies against authoritarian regimes, it undermines coalition building efforts with its own like-minded partners. American leaders have to recognize that shared values strengthen, not weaken, lasting coalition building efforts. So with that, I look forward to discussing the ways that the Commission can advance these efforts to safeguard American security, prosperity, and values. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our witnesses for excellent testimony. Uh, we'll start our questions with my uh, co-chair for the hearing, Commissioner Camphausen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've been looking forward to today's hearing in this panel with uh, eager anticipation and you have uh, as anticipated, uh, exceeded my hopes and and uh, expectations. Thank you so much for your written testimony and for your oral presentations. Uh, three questions, if we have time, Professor Sutter. The first for you. Appreciate in the in the opening of your uh, written testimony a sort of quick uh, roll up of the last twenty five years in U.S. China relations. I think that's a very helpful reference for. Um, both commissioners and, and, a, and a broader reading audience. Um, my question really is uh, maybe pivoting off of something uh, Professor Lovely said at the very outset of her testimony. She said, the US has had little success in isolating China technologically. Um, and I'll, 
I'll give you a chance to, to Professor Lovely in a minute to, to see if I've gotten that right. But if you apply that judgment uh, to the, the field of foreign policy and, and security po policy, Professor Sutter, would you, what's your assessment of the U.S. ability to shape or affect Chinese security behavior by the various methods that ha it has employed? You endorse, endorse the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, uh, and I wonder if there's more that you might add about how successful the U.S. has been in shaping Chinese foreign policy and security behavior. So we go question. Oh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the question. Um, <clears throat> I, I think the United States is very influential in China. I think the uh, the framework that uh, was followed uh, during the Trump administration was a good framework uh, that uh, that are uh, that are important and uh, and offsetting for Chinese plans. And so and uh, and the prospects uh, prospects are for an alignment. Uh, which will be something that the Chinese will have to contend with, uh, uh, and, and which they didn't have to contend with before. These are somewhat unexpected developments. Uh, this whole change in American policy was not anticipated by the Chinese. They thought they could move ahead with these incremental advances at American expense and uh, and keep keep without without cost. And now it's demonstrated that the United States is prepared for costs. And uh, and uh, and it's it's done a variety of things, and I, it could do it a lot more effectively. Uh, but uh, but the bottom line is, I think this matters a lot in Chinese calculations. And I uh, and I think that what we're not seeing when we see isolation is that we're not seeing the cost that this cost that this uh, and the diversion that this causes the Chinese, which I think is something that we need to uh, pay attention to. So I think on the security side, the Chinese have alienated India and alienated Japan and alienated Australia. Uh, this is very clear. I mean, these countries are now uh, aligning with the United States pretty strongly. And uh, India and Australia have changed a lot uh, over the past four years. And so, uh, and those are the, uh, Japan is the other big power, India is the other big power in Asia, uh, and Australia is a very important player. And so I think this is, uh, this is these, these are the networks that can be used by the United States to exert leverage uh, on China. China gets very nervous about uh, being surrounded. Uh, it's very nervous about alignments that can, because they can't do it. They don't have um, countries they can align with. Or they align with people, but they're not much. They're not worth very much. And so I think under these circumstances, I think this is a. Uh, I think these are ways that can be used. Uh, to demonstrate to China, the approach they're taking uh, has been the challenges that they pose will be countered. And I think that uh, that's what I would recommend. Thanks, Professor Sutter. So my, my quick take on your perspective is uh, there's opportunity to capitalize on Chinese missteps using the existing relationships and, and opportunities that, that the United States might have. Professor Lovely, quickly, um, Last year, mid-year or so, Premier Li Keqiang said uh, that China has more than 600 million people with a monthly income of barely uh, 1,000 renminbi. Uh, how significant is this? How consequential? It's, it's quite an acknowledgement on his part, but you didn't mention it in your testimony. I wonder if you have a perspective on how meaningful that statistic is. Thank you, and thank you for your opening comments. I found them them quite insightful. Um, I think this statistic is is very important. I think that the Chinese leadership understands that it it to retain control, which is of its utmost importance to the party, it needs to maintain stability, and that means continuing to deliver on economic uh, advancement. Uh, and it has a lot of people who are hovering just above the poverty line, uh, and the prospects for those people entering successfully into the uh, upper middle income type of activities that are needed uh, is doubtful. They have, and I think the Chinese leadership is well aware of this. They put on a, a you know, we're on top of the world, but in fact, they're very aware of their own weaknesses uh, and challenges. And I think this motivates uh, their grasping for technology. I don't think that the, that grasp to technology is going to be the answer. You're not going to take people who, you know, basically have about a seventh grade education and turn them into rocket scientists. Uh, but it's still, we have to think of these needs as we uh, approach them. On the other side of the table, it's always best to understand what your uh, 
we call it partner, uh, really needs out of the negotiation or, or deal. And um, I think that this is a key. So I see that statistic is very important. Thank you, Professor Lovely. Chair, I have another question for Dr. Cooper. And so if we have a second round, I'd- No, I'd... you know, Roy, I think we have we have plenty of time. So I'm gonna suggest that you actually go ahead now and ask it. And then if you have something else for a second round, we'll, we'll take it up in a second round. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cooper, you, you talked about the misperception of, the, of both party or the perception of both parties that time is on their side. And, um, and yet there's also a line of thinking which suggests uh, objectively there's a uh, there's a narrow window for Beijing to to achieve its ends after which uh, there'll be a a, a, a a series of factors and forces which come together which fundamentally challenge um, uh, China's ability to achieve its goals. How do we reconcile this perception of each party about it time being on their side and then this more objective uh, outside in approach, which suggests, at least in China's case, that may not be the case. Well, thanks, Commissioner Kampausen. I think this is one of the most important issues, especially on the defense side, because um, the US is going to have to be dealing with a growing China, at least for a while, uh, and a far more capable Chinese military at the same time that US defense budgets are going to be flat or maybe even declining. And so we're going to have to make some choices about when we want our capabilities to come online. And the kinds of capabilities that might come online in say the next three to five years are very different than the ones that one might want to pursue in 10 or 15 years, right? And so I think we're going to have to make some fairly big bets. And I think the Biden team will have to make some fairly big bets in their first defense budget on exactly what the timeline is that they're most worried about. My personal view is that there are some small things that are relatively cheap that we should put as top priorities. So making the crossing of the Taiwan Strait much more difficult for a large amphibious force is, uh, it's a hard challenge for us, but it's a doable challenge, right? And so buying a large number of anti-ship cruise missiles, a uh, much more capable undersea uh, mine delivery uh, capability, uh, with greater capacity as well. Those types of things we could do in the next three to five years. It will take a significant investment, but it's it's a much different kind of investment than say, uh, trying to double down on power projecting capability against a growing anti-access area denial threat. So um, the big challenge in my mind is how do we actually build these capabilities we need to field in the near term while still having the money to invest over the longer term into procurement and acquisition that will be absolutely critical for the longer term fight if we're worried about that competition down the line. And I, I think the only answer that I can come up with now is we've got to invest at the moment for the next three to five years because we know that we could end up in a window of opportunity for the Chinese in that period. Um, so we can't simply hope that we can get through that timeline towards a period when maybe we have a bit more confidence in our military advantage. Great, uh, thank you. Vice Chairman Cleveland, let's go to you next. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, the first to Dr. Lovely. Um, I was struck by your um, both your written testimony and then what you raised uh, today, that roughly 30% of the population has completed high school, um, that you have an, we have an unskilled and shrinking labor force, um, and what the impact that is on uh, in, in the shift from high growth to high quality growth that she has, she has identified. Um, I am struggling through Brant and Roski's massive tome um, uh, on economic transfer transformation, and they describe uh, deep structural inefficiencies um, where you have this, um, this cycle of, as you describe, uh, the desire by the CCP for stability leads to subsidies to state-owned enterprises to maintain the labor market, um, but those SOEs are inefficient. There is a there is disincentive in the labor market to be productive because you get paid the same no matter what. 
Um, there's, there is, we have a witness later today who talks about there's actually disincentive for innovation because it would attract attention to you in an environment of censorship and so-called anti-corruption. Um, and then you have this, these, this pace of debt accumulation, whether you look at it from the borrowing side or the lending side relative to GDP, it's a, it's again, a, 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 a serious structural issue. And so you get to the end of that kind of characterization of the challenges and you argue in, to summarize, summarize it, and I want to make sure I get it right, that the path ahead is for China to go back to reforms. And in the written testimony, you don't describe that in much depth. So I'm, I'm curious, um, what's the evidence that under Xi, um, that reforms have any real possibility or potential. Um, and yeah, and let's just leave it at that. That, you know, how would you characterize the reforms that are necessary and how realistic is that? Because in the world I live in and, and it, now it's, you know, we have, we have the facts that we know and the anxieties that we fear, but in between those, there is the reality that we have to live in. And and I'm I guess I'm challenging your your construct of what the possibilities for progress really are. Well, thank you, Commissioner Cleveland, for the question. And um, you might know the latest information on China's productivity growth falling off sharply is due to a team uh, where Lauren Brandt was one of the key members. Right. So it's a continuation of that. Uh, the new book written by uh, Scott Roselle and uh, Hal are, I think, uh, something you might want to add to your, to your long reading list. Um, and financial stability is... Uh, uh, discussed in the new IMF report, right. which came out right. in January. So yeah, you're up. So you see, I think you appreciate the challenges that China is facing. Now, what are the prospects for reform? Uh, you know, this is the um, $1,000 question, as they say. We see areas where there has been reform, where there is reform, there has been real opening, uh, as uh, shown by the massive inflows of foreign investors. Uh, both for on direct, direct investment and portfolio investment. Markets are opening up. That means greater participation by the private sector. Uh, but at the same time, we see a doubling down on so-called state guidance. Uh, the continue, the uh, communique that came out from the work conference in October, it talked about the need for high quality governance uh, for the state to provide guidance to the private sector while still allowing the market to have a dominant role in resource allocation. To me, this is a massive contradiction. Uh, we need to see how it will play out. I have spoken directly with Chinese economists and frankly, honestly, what they tell me just just seems kind of like googly gop. I, I, it doesn't make sense. How is like, for example, dual circulation different than what's come before? Uh, they seem to have to repeat what you know what is coming down. So I think we really don't know the prospects for reform, given what you're going to hear this afternoon. I hope on the political side, uh, may be very dim. So yeah, I'm I'm reassured by your uh, the realistic characterization just now because I I felt your testimony. Uh, was a little rosy in terms of, you know, they have all of these anxieties. They need to recognize the only path ahead. But it, it, um, uh, I'm less optimistic about whether or not they will um, ease, uh, or whether they will relax this state grip. Um, and I, I don't see the increase in um, foreign investment. As anything other than a, a they're starved for capital, and and um, so they're going to relax some restrictions, but I'm not sure that that doesn't present huge risk to American investors. Which leads me to the question for all three of you: um, She has appointed himself to the head of virtually every leading small group, um, as characterized by the uh, President Biden's National Security Advisor for Indo-Pacific um, views. This is China's moment. Uh, Campbell wrote an, uh, a piece a couple of months ago saying that China believes this is their moment uh, because it's Xi's moment. 
What happens if she dies? Very good question. It's a, uh, it, this is very much, uh, uh, they're dependent on this guy and the whole, the whole system is, is, uh, surra- is, is him. I mean, he's the link in, in all these decisions. It, it would be amazingly, uh, uh, uh amazing flux. Uh, if that were to happen. Any other thought? I mean, I just, this, this accumulation of power in one person feels unprecedented, uh, both on the economic, political, and security fronts, and or on all fronts. So, any thoughts? Yeah, if I may, I think that um, the reluctance to reform is reflective of his need to continue to provide goodies to his group, support group. So we see that he may be seen as the supreme leader, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have factions to contend with. And I think if we did see, as you said, his his passing, uh, we would see a fo- power struggle within China. In my view, you're going to have very eminent political scientists this afternoon. But I think when we think about, I wrote a paper looking at whether China would actually ever pull the trigger to join the CPTPP. Uh, and particularly as it relates to state-owned enterprises, I think politically the answer is no, that he's dependent on keeping uh, that those people, uh, the, the state-owned enterprises and the resources that they provide to him in place. So supreme but insecure leader. Mr. Dr. Cooper? I, I agree with that. And I, I think this is where the challenge for the United States is to figure out how you build a strategy that can manage both of those possible worlds, right? A world where you have potentially a China that continues to somehow manage to grow, maybe not at the rates that we've become used to, but but certainly to continue to grow fairly rapidly and increase its military capabilities and its economic leverage throughout Asia and the rest of the world, but also a world in which um, I think we could all imagine a genuine political crisis over the next decade, um, leading to you know the dissolution of the Chinese state. And so, um, I think the challenge here is uh, we have to be realistic that both of these are possibilities. Um, And I think so often the debate in China for sure, but often in the United States sort of assumes the first. It assumes that 40 years of incredible Chinese successes on the economic side are going to continue um, without accepting the possibility that they might not. Um, And there's risk to that as well, right? And the biggest risk in my, from my point of view is that countries in the region actually start to believe this, right? And think that they can make big bets on China and that those are riskless bets. And so I think part of our job is to show that yes, democracies aren't perfect, but actually we do leadership transitions okay. Not not perfect all the time, as I said, (laughs) but but even in difficult periods, democracies can handle leadership transitions. It's hard for me to imagine China being able to say the same thing about what will happen when Xi Jinping steps down. Thank you. Excellent. A very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, Commissioner Borokov, you're next. Thank you. Um, building a little bit, Dr. Lovely, on on what uh, Vice Chairman Cleveland uh, commented about your comments and uh, uh, our chairman uh, of the hearing today, uh, Commissioner Camphausen. At the beginning of what you you talked about, you mentioned that same that same comment that everyone keeps bringing up that we haven't been able to isolate them economically and that's clearly true and and in your recommendations you said well we really need to uh, recognize their anxieties and build pathways to respond to that I, I'd like you to expound just a little bit on on what you think could, should be done uh, regarding their anxieties specifically Thank you. Well, we know that there is a very, there's still a lot of cooperation between our two governments underneath the political level. Um, this happens uh, in at in all uh, spheres of economic life. So we, we still do have, you know, com- ways of communicating and operating day to day with China. I think at the political level, we could acknowledge uh, some of their challenges. They won't like it in some sense because they always want to be seen as, as you know, destined to rule. Uh, but uh, clearly, we need to understand that the role that technology will play. And here's where I think sort of standard and norm setting. We know that norms that we have, for example, on the trade front, uh, were created in the at the end of the 1980s and early 1990s. 
And we need to address what is acceptable behavior. What are the um, boundaries or acceptable uh, boundaries for national security exclusions? Uh, we saw that those quote unquote norms were violated under the Trump administration, but no new norms have been put in place for years. So you can understand the frustrations that have built up. The United States in its response with, uh, uh, with FIRMA and ECRA, I think took very important steps. We need to make sure those that those decisions are made in a way that carefully balances the U.S. Uh, costs and benefits, not only obviously in economics, but also in security uh, and, and uh, soci other societal issues. Um, and there have been some new proposals being put forward even over the last uh, couple of weeks about how we can do that. I think we invite Chinese participation, uh, but expect them to join only if they reach these high standards and, and develop mechanisms uh, for responding quickly. I think a, a main frustration with the WTO, among others, is that it takes forever to get any action. Uh, I've, I've worked on uh, solar, solar equipment. We saw what happened where China became dominant player in solar equipment in a period of six to seven years. I mean, comparative advantage doesn't change that fast. We knew it had to be driven by government action. And yet we were only able to really respond at the end of that period. I think that the United States needs to engage and say we need faster things, but hopefully do it in a way that, uh, as Zach mentioned, uh, you know, acknowledges and builds on our um, our values uh, and alliances by being clear about what we think the rules are. So I think that's a way, in a sense, to address their anxieties. I don't mean that we need to put them on the, on the couch <laughs> with a nod to Dr. Cleveland, but um, you know, we do need to understand that they will get it somewhere. You know, and if you don't provide pass, at least uh, above board, they are going to continue to do it uh, through other means. So you led right into my next question. I appreciate <laughs> that tremendously. Uh, you, co you commented that uh, we need to employ restrictions to enforce those standards. Uh, and I'm curious as to specifically what kinds of restrictions would you like to employ that have been out there and talked about that we're not doing yet? You know, we've been in the on the labor front, and I don't always agree with some of the things, but the, on the USCMCA, we have a rapid response mechanism uh, that would have received bipartisan support. I think we need to think about some kind of rapid response mechanism. I, I have studied the trilateral statement on subsidies where the U.S. took a fairly hard position, harder than our two allies, Japan and the, in the EU. Uh, you know, trying to wage this, you know, measuring things like uh, mar market prices, a whole procedure, I think is in a sense, it, the, the horse will be out of the barn by the time we get done with that. So we have to think about some kind of conditional or provisional uh, responses uh, in the tech area, either where tech is being misused or where we feel that it's embodying stolen technology. Uh, I believe that Dr. Cooper also mentioned, um, you know, the need to, you um, on the on the tech front in particular, uh, you know, use targeted pressure on malign actors. So we need to say, you know, if we won't buy from you, you're not going to sell it to Japan, uh, Japan or Germany. And I think this is where we have uh, really been lacking by failing to bring our allies along with us. That's a great comment, and I really appreciate that very much. You're welcome, Madam Chairman. Right. If I have one more, if I'll do it, or I can wait till a second round. Uh, sorry. Why don't you go ahead and ask and ask now quickly. Okay, uh, 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 Chairman, Vice Chairman uh, Cleveland also mentioned the fact that despite the fact that all this tremendous money is being invested, it really appears to be uh, they're seeking it out because of the tremendous debt they're incurring over the past five years. My question is, do, do you agree that, th that they are headed for some kind of Armageddon economically uh, unless uh, uh, or because they're driving that debt so high, or are they going to be able to keep this facade up long enough that people begin to believe that reality? And in fact, they're they're going to be as strong as they say they are. I'm sorry, is that directed at Dr. Cooper or me? No, at you, Dr. Lovely. I'm oh, sorry. okay. I'm sorry. Um, I think you know China has enormous resources still, uh, and uh, you know its 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 consumption level is very low relative to income. Uh, people don't have a voice to rebel if more needs to be extracted in a sense to support the system. 
So uh, I don't see that. I don't see uh, the debt could be a problem. I don't see it being, uh, you know, a, a, a crucial or bringing them down in that sense. Uh, I think a failure to continue to deliver uh, on growth is, is will be more. And I think that the main cliff points are still out ahead of them, but not that far out ahead. We're talking within the next, certainly within the next planning period, which is until 2035. And I guess I should ask Dr. Cooper or or uh, uh, anyone else that wants to comment, do you disagree? I, I don't disagree. And of course, you know, uh, Dr. Lovely is the, the real economic expert on this. So I, I guess I, I would just add that I think there's a real question across autocracies, right? When they reach this point where they have a choice about whether to drive reform or not. And traditionally, when autocracies make a decision to stop investing in reform and to uh, increase their state control of their economies, I think you you tend to see that uh, lead, as Dr. Lovely said, you know, to some regression, right, in their economy, just just naturally. And I think when you combine that with the political discussion we were having earlier about a more repressive uh, regime controlled by one man. Increasingly, it just seems to me that it's going to be very difficult for China to spur the kind of economic growth that they would need um, to really uh, drive a much more uh, rapid economic growth than than the projections that many people are thinking of now. You know, down in the two, three, four percent level over the next decade or two. Thanks. Thanks for letting me ask that question. I'm dying to ask a lot more, but I'm going to listen carefully. <laughs> we'll we'll see if we have some more time, Commissioner Goodwin. Your turn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all uh, to the witnesses for your testimony this morning. Dr. Lovely, I'll keep you on the hot seat if that's okay. In your written testimony, you touched on some factors other than economic growth that would affect the quality of life domestically in China, including environmental concerns and air quality concerns. And you raised them in your testimony within the context of domestic challenges, domestic economic challenge, challenges, but I'd like to broaden uh, our consideration of those issues a little bit and get, get your thoughts. Um, in that testimony, you mentioned, of course, given these concerns, um, it was interesting that China was continuing to expand its fleet of coal-fired electric power generating facilities with the construction of new plants in 2018 and 2019 and a rush of new permits being approved in 2020. Um, the increase, of course, of this capacity raises questions about the ability of China to meet its stated objection or objectives uh, and compliance standards under the Paris Accords. Uh, but at the same time, they are investing around the globe in BRI projects in very carbon intensive investment uh, infrastructure projects and the like, and most critically, more coal fired power plants. And some estimates have suggested that the emissions from these BRI countries will exceed the standards set forth in the Paris Accord. And that the increase in these emissions are primarily driven by these Chinese investments. So given this construction and export of coal-fired capacity uh, and the Biden's administration's recent decision to rejoin the Paris Accord, how do these Chinese activities affect our bilateral economic engagement and activities across the board with China? Thank you. Thank you for raising the environmental uh, issues that were in the report. Um, it's a really hard area. I think the uh, stop start uh, behavior that we're seeing in China, where they're permitting, green lighting more coal fired power plants in the last two years and, and uh, you know, in the five before. While in, you know, they're they're putting in one wind turbine basically every five minutes. Uh, what is this all about? And I think we're seeing that that power was devolved from the center to the provinces. The provinces want to keep those state-owned enterprises, those jobs going, uh, and see coal's a cheap source of energy. And so they they keep drilling down on it while the cent the she makes all these international pronouncements that are trying to tie their hands in terms of uh, you know non-fossil fuel energy sources. So I think you're seeing the difficulty uh, of a big decentralized authoritarian system. 
uh, where she's power is not absolute. Uh, and yet you see him trying to, I think, increasingly tie their hands on the international stage. I mean, the fact that they should repeach emission by 2030, we all know, is going to be a big ask for the economy. So um, you can keep those same uh, power, these those same political interests uh, occupied uh, by uh, having state contracts fulfilled overseas. So I think these are linked uh, through the domestic political challenges which she uh, is faced with. Uh, and it would be interesting to hear this afternoon if there are others uh, who are more versed in the politics of this than I who see that same linkage. So I think, again, as we see this contradiction between market and state, uh, we see this playing out also in its commitment to uh, the uh, gradual decarbonization of its economy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sutter, one follow-up question. In, in your testimony, you seem to suggest or, or perhaps characterize that the incoming administration's desire to engage or perhaps cooperate with China on some of these climate issues could uh, well, you characterize it as a preoccupation, and I suppose the question for me is: Do you are you meaning to suggest that that could inhibit our ability to counter China in other areas where necessary on trade? Uh, yes, um, I think the um, uh, our discussion today shows how complicated this is. We're going to apply pressure on China. We're going to counter them in various ways. All these types of uh, understandings, this targeted approach—it's uh, extremely complicated. And uh, and so you, uh, the upshot of this is, I'm not sure how you can do this uh, in a country like the United States to bring everybody together and to say, "Oh, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine," and, and we're going to do this, we're going to do this. We're going to be really busy uh, with, with this sort of thing if we if we do this. And so I think what we need we need to have some sort of sense of uh, of are we trying to limit the leverage of the Chinese? Are we trying to enhance the leverage of the Chinese in, uh, as, they as they continue? As I tried to emphasize in my testimony, they are doing all the challenges that they were doing before. They haven't stopped. And this, is, this is ongoing. And so I think that should be day one uh, and what we, that we deal with that. And I think there is a contradiction in climate change because I think if you start prioritizing climate change, uh, we had an experience with the Obama government uh, uh, where climate change seemed to override other issues. And so the South China Sea Islands and so forth were all being uh, occupied by the Chinese at that time. So I think it's it's important that we 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 build our leverage in a whole range of ways so that we can go into these targeted areas in a more uh, effective way. And I think building leverage against China and climate change may not may be in contradiction. Uh, I think and and so we, I think we need to ask how much do we need to cater to China in order to get them to cooperate on climate change? My point is my my sense is in looking at the situation is that they're going to do what they're going to do on climate change, whether they like us or they don't like us. And so I think, but it, that that judgment needs to be assessed more carefully. But I do think this is a, a contradiction. It, it it will undermine. It can easily undermine the sense of uh, leverage that the United States might have in dealing with China on these very, uh, all these other issues that we have disagreements. Well, I, I would have certainly agree with you that it's complicated, but I would hope it's not complicated. You know, I know, you know, other countries in the region, uh, South Korea and Japan are engaging with China where they can, uh, but obviously trying to counter them where they must. So. They're engaging with them in trilateral trade negotiations, but obviously standing up to them in other contexts. And I would hope we certainly uh, could do the same. Uh, if that's what you think will work, uh, okay. Uh, I, I wonder. <laughs> well, I've, no, seen, I've seen this I mean, before, <laughs> and, uh, and I don't think it works very well. I think if it gets very complicated. The Chinese are really good at manipulating us. You have all these agreements. And uh, they don't do what you think they're going to do. You got to look at what they're doing, and uh, and they're they're doing uh, what what the chair what the chair said in the beginning. All these challenges. That's what. Well, that really goes to to my question. Even if they were meeting stated emissions targets domestically in China, um, 
how could we characterize that as compliance if they are exporting all that capacity and those emissions to other countries? So anyway, I'm well. Dr. Cooper, is there anything you wanted to add? Well, I think this is a critical issue. And I will say I was encouraged yesterday by the statement that John Kerry made, right, where he said that uh, climate change issues did not need to be traded for anything else with China. I think that's important. And I think we should hold him to that commitment, right? I, I think China also needs to cooperate on climate just as we do. Um, there's no reason that we should have to sacrifice our interests in other areas for China to cooperate on climate. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the commission has a critical role here to keep highlighting this issue and say, yes, we both need to cooperate on climate, but that doesn't mean that the U.S. has to be quiet on Hong Kong, Xinjiang, South China Sea, Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we should stick to our guns on this. Um, and, and I hope John Kerry and the Biden team follow through on that commitment. Great. All right. Commissioner Talent, your turn. Thank you, and thanks to the three of you for really enlightening testimony. I agree with what was just said about climate change. I would expect the Chinese are going to start talking a lot now about how they're still a developing country and see what they can get us to believe as far as that's concerned. So my question, I think, is pretty simple. I was intrigued uh, uh, by Dr. Sutter's testimony um, for his observation that in the last few years, it's been a pretty strong bipartisan consensus in Congress that and I think I'm quoting you correctly, doctor, that China is, at least under the CCP, uh, is a systemic threat to the global world order and well-being. So I'm just, I'm curious if, if you all were sitting with a member of Congress who said that to you, and we do talk to them and brief them all the time, uh, and they asked you, am I correct in characterizing uh, China that way? Uh, what what would you say? I'd be happy to say, but it, I, I agree with that that position. So uh, uh, I would I would then I would then lay out where the Chinese challenge the United States in a whole range of ways. Now this uh, disadvantages the United States. It's uh, and it's designed to overshadow uh, the world order that the United States relies on. And I think that world order is better for humanity, uh, in, my, in my sense. And so, uh, so I would say that they look at how this is happening, and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and that's what I mean by a systemic uh, uh, danger. And I think that's. Uh, so I, I've, I've examined this very thoroughly, sir, and I've tried to look at it. I'm an evidence-based analyst. It's sort of boring, but I've looked at the evidence, and it's very strong across the board in Chinese behavior. So you just have to say, just lay it out in different areas. I, think if I would start with this cooperation with Putin. That might be one way to get some of his attention. But there's, there's a whole systematic uh, agenda here that you can, you can raise. It's, uh, it's, I have about eight topics uh, that you could... Yes. Anybody else want to comment? I'll just add one thought, which is, you know, I, I think part of what we're seeing from China is that over the last decade, there's been a rapid change in China's behavior. Um, and my view is that that's in large part because the Chinese Communist Party increasingly believes that it is in a relatively strong position. Um, and so I, I think the kinds of changes that we're seeing in Chinese behavior, um, they create a bit of a tension between the longstanding China expert community and the more functional community that often looks at what happens when a rising power rises, right? And so mm -hmm. um, I think the kinds of trends that Dr. Sutter is identifying, they're, you know, we absolutely see them in the data. Um, but I think we're actually going to see even more of an acceleration of this kind of assertive, aggressive behavior over the next few years. Um, because if you listen to what the Chinese are saying, they are so confident, right? You know, Xi Jinping saying in the fall that time and momentum are on our side. It's hard to be clearer than that. And I, I think, um, so I think we might even see an acceleration of this kind of behavior in the next few years. 
Be, and, and so I take it that's because at bottom, you think that they want a world of authoritarianism where they are free to engage in aggression. And so if they're confident they can achieve that, they will. But if they are subject to costs and consequences, they may not. So that's basically your your characterization of them. I, I don't want to assert that they would actively prefer to spread, you know, an, a Leninist system globally. I, I think that evidence is at least less clear in my view on that. I think, you know, as, as Aaron Friedberg and others have argued, um, what they definitely want is a world that's safe for autocracy. Um, whether they want a world that is autocratic, I think, is, is a slightly separate question. Um, but when when I read some of what's come out recently on the ideological question from China, uh, my assessment is that um, increasingly there's a view that there it's going to be very, very hard for the Communist Party and for the United States to coexist with both pushing slightly different ideological frames. So I actually think if you look back 10 years ago, I'm not sure I thought this ideological competition was going to be quite as fraught. Um, but now I, I think it is central and I see this in wolf warrior diplomacy, right? Where um, the Chinese are stepping up attacks, not, they used to do lots of things to try and make China look good and positive and strong on the world stage. And now increasingly they're taking things from the Russian playbook and just sort of attacking democracies um, even when it's costly to China for doing so. Um, and that makes me think that there may be a bit of a shift uh, of views on this issue with invasion. Yeah, Dr. Lovely. Yeah, I was just going to hearken back to testimony before this commission a year ago from Dr. Uh, Barry Norton, who described China as uh, strategic opportunists. Uh, it's a very flexible regime in a lot of ways. It's resilient. Well, what that suggests is that we can change, at least uh, in the short run, some of their behavior. In my short run, I mean the next 10 to 15 years, uh, by changing the opportunities. For ex I think a good example here is the approach that it's taken to Australia. You know, Australia, 33% of Chinese of Australian exports go to China. So China is beginning to view it as kind of a, another province of China, uh, and it has just decided to whack it around. Uh, you know, where is the international support for Australia? I think we have to say that when you use your power, your economic size in this way, there will be a cost, a cost that you may not realize uh, the size of uh, to start to deter some of this behavior. And that requires us to have, uh, as 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 uh, Dr. Cooper said, uh, you know, uh, some understanding with our allies on shared values. And, and right now, frankly, U.S. tried to take advantage of its size, not only with the U.S.-China trade war, but with the steel and aluminum tariffs, the section, the use of national security. So uh, frankly, you know, our credibility on that score is a little bit low. We need to rebuild it uh, and to then change the, the chessboard for China in terms of its uh, the options for its strategic opportunism. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Commissioner Wessel. Finding my mute button, thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, your testimony. Um, it comes, as you all know, at a critical time with, a, as was pointed out earlier, a new president uh, and a new Congress. Um, and, um, you know, we are at somewhat of an inflection point in terms of what the policy is going to be going forward. Um, it's been variously attributed to Lenin, uh, the quote, when it comes time to hang the capitalists, they will vie with each other for the rope contract. Um, and I, I think, uh, in my view, the rope uh, consists of capital. Uh, technology and potentially markets, uh, access to markets. Um, recently, the, the EU signed a investment deal with China. Um, and last year, perhaps the most, one of the more less heralded, but more uh, effective components of uh, the phase one trade deal was uh, the opening of the financial market. Uh, of China's financial market. Um, it seems to me that we are falling all over ourselves to give China the capital, and it is not simply to address the uh, 
uh, the debt needs, the debt uh, overhang, which uh, uh, Vice Chairman Cleveland and I have co-chaired several hearings on, but it's to fuel their techno-nationalism. Um, separately on the uh, technology side, we've seen uh, the Trump administration uh, broadly use sanctions, both within the entity list and well as the DOD designation um, to uh, restrict certain uh, uh, technology transfers. And all of that, of course, will be in question as we look at who the next head of the Bureau of Industry of Security will be and the overall approach of the Biden administration. Um, I'll get to the question. The question is, um, do you view our uh, provision, increasing provision of capital to China, both the US and the EU now and others. Uh, Dr. Lovely, you talked about FDI levels um, as supporting or denigrating our interests. Uh, Dr. Lovely, I believe last year in your technology, in your testimony, you indicated that 46% of China's exports emanate from foreign invested enterprises. And I believe you said that for the U.S. that's 60 percent. I can correct me if I'm wrong. But we're fueling China's rise. We're addressing their capital needs, uh, and we are companies that are going there that are investing are all too often industrial uh, engaged in industrial tourism uh, and offshoring of U.S. jobs and production. So. Starting with you, Dr. Lovely, uh, how do you view uh, the opening of the investment market uh, and what uh, the EU has recently done, whether it's uh, advantaging Western norms and change or whether it's fueling China's um, rise? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Wessel. I think that, uh, you know, the opening of, of China's financial market, as you say, has really uh, taken taken speed uh, in the last uh, two years, uh, especially since the completion of the phase one deal, although I would argue that a lot of these negotiations were already underway, but uh, clearly it moved China's hand. Um, I don't see, I guess what I would differ is that I don't see China's needing our capital. They're, they are the best savers in the world. What they need is our know-how. Uh, I have done, uh, you know, academic work looking at uh, takeover of Chinese firms by foreign firms, uh, and we find a, a market difference between takeover by OECD-based multinationals versus uh, Taiwan, Macau, a lot of round-tripping money. There's a, there's a big difference. So I think that's what they're seeking, not so much the money, but the know-how, the technology. Uh, so that's what, what they're seeking. On the in terms of the financial, our, our companies want in. Uh, because of the markets, clearly, there's a lot of money to be made. We know PayPal, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, a whole slew of others have been green lighted to go in, uh, and they're doing so eagerly. Uh, for the Chinese, as I mentioned, their service sector is highly unproductive, and this is going to help them raise the productivity of their financial sector, which they need. Uh, to better allocate capital. And this again goes back to this, this uh, dual personality that they have, where they are reforming, they are seeking uh, more uh, deeper integration, more market allocation. And at the same time, the state believes that it can continue to guide the economy. And, and that shows up in the increasing uh, share of investment, which has been flowing to the very low return, low productivity state enterprises, and which has gotten worse through the pandemic, because that's where a lot of the stimulus money went. So I, I think we see again this this dual dual uh, uh, approach, which I think is headed to uh, some serious conflict com with each, with each strand. Uh, whether that our, our participation benefits the United States or not, I think again is something that the US government needs to consider where are our interests at you know really at risk here. Uh, how do we undertake risk mitigation strategies? Uh, is it a threat to us if Goldman Sachs or, or other uh, financial service companies provide uh, you know, better access to retirement accounts for Chinese citizens? Uh, I would argue not, 
Although we have to remember that China is a very large economy. And as we see in its behavior toward Australia, uh, will not be uh, afraid to use that power once, for example, its firms uh, are a large share of holdings of major US or other company uh, pension funds, for example. So I think that we have to go in with our eyes open, recognize the opportunities, uh, and then begin to do a better risk assessment and risk mitigation. Well, um... I, and I would like to turn to the other two witnesses for a quick comment. I do want to say that I have, you know, um, reservations about your approach. You know, I think the question of uh, the recent um, activities of the uh, Chinese leadership regarding Alibaba and others, uh, the lack of transparency, et cetera, um, I do believe there are serious risks. Uh, and uh, there are systemic risks, not just to an individual investor, but otherwise. But uh, that's a separate debate uh, we will have to have probably offline. But uh, Dr. Suter and Mr. Cooper, can you uh, provide your thoughts, if, if any? Very briefly, um, this uh, what you pointed to is that I think the major dilemma that the United States faces in getting its uh, getting uh, an effective uh, counter to the various challenges that China poses. Uh, uh, the business community is the community that uh, is very divided about this and uh, doesn't want to do it. Uh, Japan and, and South Korea were mentioned earlier by, uh, uh, by uh, Commissioner Good Goodman, and, uh, and that's the same problem they face. Uh, their business community doesn't want to do this either. And so what sort of a, uh, of a, uh, of a uh, alignment are we going to have vis-a-vis uh, -vis China in dealing with all these the bad things that they do. And it seems to me that the, the weakness, uh, and the Chinese are well aware of this, and Xi Jinping, obviously, when he, the EU uh, uh, negotiations, he made concessions at the end, and and uh, and uh, and he's working with the, the plus three now to try to ease tensions there. So I, I think this is, uh, America really has to figure out, uh, as, a, as, a, as an entity, as a uni unified place, what exactly uh, is is their interest, and I think the business community is is basically a, a drag on trying to come up with an effective strategy. And I think that's the case in Japan and South Korea and many other places as well. Thank you. And I would just add, I, I think the trick here is targeting the bad actors in the Chinese system and providing incentives for the good actors to actually continue good behavior. And I think part of the challenge we've seen, especially in the Trump administration, is that you know the use of broad-based tariffs, for example, it it provides no incentive for uh, actors within the Chinese system to act uh, to act according to international rules and standards, right? Um, because we are going to penalize them regardless. And so I think what we need are much more targeted measures that go after the companies, the other entities that we think are the most problematic. Uh, because they engage in malign behavior and to do that with our allies and partners. And then for those uh, companies that, that we think are, are largely playing by the rules to actually show that we're willing to work with them. Um, and I think that provides the kinds of incentives that will over time, hopefully at least change some Chinese behavior. But look, we're still going to have to go after those malign actors in a very tough targeted way. I, I appreciate it. I've gone over. Uh, it's hard for me to see how you choose, quote unquote, good actors uh, against a system, uh, against the CCP's leadership and uh, control and influence over companies, but uh, a separate debate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. My turn. Um, one of the hazards of of coming at the very end is the is the 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 a range of issues that have been raised before me. Uh, just a couple of comments before I ask. First, Dr. Sutter, you and I have been doing this a long time and have seen going through the 1990s the hazard of sacrificing uh, many of our interests in pursuit of one goal. And I would specifically say. Uh, many things were sacrificed in the 1990s in the name of getting China's cooperation in dealing with North Korea. And look where we are. It it didn't exactly accomplish anything. So, I mean, it's 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 beyond time for us to be more sophisticated in the approach that we take and our ability and willingness to to juggle issues. 
the second one, um, Dr. Lovely, I don't actually, maybe I misunderstood what you were saying, but I don't think that with that, that the goal has actually been to isolate China, with the exception, of course, of some fairly recent actions on uh, restrictions on on technology. So. Um, I, I always I always resist because then we get into the are we are we for engagement or not engagement? And the question is always right. What are what are the terms under which that engagement is happening? Um, my third comment, of course, is just um, a skepticism again after having done this for a long time about uh, Chinese intentions to comply with the agreements that they make. And I think that that's an issue that you know the the Europeans, if they if the European uh, Parliament uh, goes forward and and agrees to this, you know. Um, validates this this uh, agreement, then I think they're going to be seeing that they might not get everything that they thought that they were going to get. Um, but, but my question sort of gets to um, this issue of are they playing? Do you think that they are playing a zero sum game? And if they are, particularly then Dr. Lovely, how do we how do how does incorporating them into norms and standards, and and particularly there, I'm thinking of standard setting bodies on technology. But but how does how does that accomplish anything, if if what they're intending to do is to use those norms and standards to advantage themselves and disadvantage us and the rest of the rest of the world in these issues? So for all of you, it's is it a zero sum game? Do you think they're playing a zero sum game with us generally? And, and then Dr. Lovely, particularly how that how that has an impact on um, your your recommendation that they be incorporated more into norms and standard setting bodies. Well, thank you, Dr. Madam Chairman. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you very much for that challenging question. Um, I, I do not see that they are playing a zero sum game. I think that the world has benefited enormously from China's uh, entry into the global economy. That doesn't mean that we have gotten our fair share. That means that we have benefited. So zero sum is where one side takes all the gain. And I don't, I don't see that that's what's, what's happening. Uh, they will take what they can get. And I see this standard setting as a way for us to get our house in order and to say that we are willing to have you participate if you adhere to these norms. Uh, we're not willing to participate if you don't. I think that China uh, does need these kinds of guidance for figuring out where the guardrails are. Uh, otherwise, they will just simply run ripshod in a way. I think, again, going back to my statement about Australia, we need to be clear as to where we will say this is not acceptable behavior, and we have not been clear. And that's how I see the standards uh, and norm setting in emerging technologies as really key. So let them know ahead of time. So I, I would stand by my recommendation. I think that that's vitally needed. I think most people in the industry uh, would as well. I don't see the business community, unlike Dr. Sutton, I don't see the business community as necessarily adversarial on this. They do want to make profit. They do want to enter into new markets. You know, frankly, that's the capitalist system. That's what we want them to do. What we need to do is to uh, provide the right guidance to them, to, to do the hard work of understanding uh, where the risks are and how they can be mitigated. And I, I, I do think that we have used a big bat lately. It's been very broad uh, as, as, as uh uh, Zach Cooper mentioned, um, but we haven't done enough homework. And we talked about this two years ago with this commission, and the commission has been very active in, in trying to signal the need for better uh, uh, information, analysis, and, and, and then follow through on the part of the entire U.S. government. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Dr. Sutter? Um, just, uh, I think I agree with uh, what has been just said, and, uh, and I'm grateful to be part of this panel. Uh, just to do your question about zero sum, uh, the way I look at the Chinese and most of these challenges that I see them doing to the United States is not necessarily at going after the United States. It's basically we're in the way. These things that they want in their headlong pursuit of wealth and power, uh, we're in the way. We're the main obstacle uh, in all these different areas. And, uh, and that's what they want. They want those things to get out of the way. And they want to have their they want to have their development approach to continue, and uh, and that's what they're about. It's not that they want to take over the world or have a new world order. No, they just want to continue to advance, and uh, in their in the way they do it, and uh, and we're in the way, and the Western norms are in the way, and uh, and this is uh, so it's not zero sum, but whenever those things are in the way, well that's. That's, that's that's what they want to overcome in some one way or another. 
Dr. Cooper? I very much agree with both of those comments. And I would just add, you know, I, I think it differs based on the domain. So in the security domain, I do think we are in a zero sum competition and anything that makes China stronger in the security domain, I, th I think makes us less secure and vice versa. Um, in the economic domain, I, I think actually in, in some areas it's positive sum. Um, it, you know, it's obviously highly competitive, but I don't quite see that as, uh, as a fully zero sum world yet. And then you've got areas in the middle, like the technology area, where it's probably a little bit of both. And I think this is where we have a real challenge, which is that we have to be able to bring allies and partners along. And um, some of those allies and partners are going to worry a lot about the security sphere. And that's how we can get so much cooperation from the Quad, for example. But for those allies and partners that still focus most on the economic relationships, that they still see the relationship, at least as in some areas, positive sum. And I think we've got to try to at least convince them that we're willing to work with them and um, that we understand that cooperation sometimes with the Chinese is going to be necessary, but that it has to be done in a way, uh, as others have said, that protects their interests and makes sure that if they strike a deal with the Chinese, that actually there's some follow through on that deal, right? And that if you become more dependent on Chinese trade, um, that you actually have some off ramps in case the Chinese start using trade and economic and financial tools as leverage against you. Um, so I think it's got to unfortunately sort of combine both of these, these forces because the uh, Chinese strategy is different across the different sectors of the competition. Great, um, thank you. Uh, I guess I just noticed there that, uh, that the topic of dual circulation came up, but there's also this sense I have um, that that there's dual messaging that's going on, right? What one thing that the that that the CCP is promoting inside China, and I'm always struck by last year when one of our staff sort of uncovered this phrase that they are exhorting the CCP members to be the grave diggers of capitalism, and then the face that they are showing outside as they are trying to to get access to capital, get access to markets, and all of that is quite is quite different and how ultimately we reconcile or they reconcile those two visions is going to have a big impact. So thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we might have some other questions. We've run out of time for this panel. So um, if you guys agree, we might have some questions that we'd like to send to you for the record. Um, and with that, we will break until 1.05. Um, so people have a chance to get lunch and we'll start our second panel at 1.05. Thank you again. It was a great way to start off our, our 20, um, 2021 hearing cycle, setting, setting the framework for the issues that we're going to have to be grappling with. So thanks, thanks to all of you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.